You're listening to the Bahai World News Service. Now live at local house of worship. In this episode, we are joined by guests who help to coordinate collaborative initiatives of the Association for Baha'i Studies in North America, as well as participants from a recent seminar hosted by the Association, exploring questions about methodology in the social sciences. They share what the Association for Baha'i Studies is learning about how spiritual principles can illuminate new paths towards investigating social reality in the pursuit of building a more just and peaceful world. The participants in this episode join the news service from the United States. We hear from Selvi Adaikalam Zabihi. I work with the U.S. Baha'i Office of Public Affairs and I also serve with the Association for Baha'i Studies North America on its Committee for Collaborative Initiatives. Michael Kalberg. I'm a professor at Western Washington University with a focus on peace and justice studies. I also serve on the Association for Baha'i Studies Committee for Collaborative Initiatives. Malik Nash. I am a PhD student in the history department at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Uh, and my research focus is uh, diasporic African history before 1850. And Negin Tusi. I'm a professor at Cal State East Bay in Northern California, and I'm a social psychologist by training. From the Baha'i World News Service, this is In Conversation, a podcast series that explores experiences from Baha'i efforts to contribute to social progress from the grassroots to the international level. Well, some people might think the Association for Baha'i Studies is an association for studying the history of the Baha'i community or its theology or other traditional concerns in the field of religious studies. And of course, all those things are possible within the association, but the association's purpose is much broader. It aims to foster processes of learning about how to apply insights from the Baha'i teachings and from the experience of the Baha'i community to the betterment of humanity. But the association assumes that science and religion have to be brought into harmony. And part of what this involves is learning how the application of spiritual principles, like the principles of oneness and justice, can be relevant across a wide range of professional and academic contexts. The activities of the association are open to anyone who's engaged in academic and professional discourses, including students who are just becoming engaged. To advance its efforts, the association fosters spaces and processes characterized by collective learning through study, consultation, action, reflection among people in similar fields. And these spaces include workshops, reading groups, writing groups, other small collaborative projects, intensive weekend seminars, a large annual conference, and a peer-reviewed journal. Ms. Adaikalam Zabihi describes the importance of considering fundamental assumptions about the nature of reality in light of both science and religion, providing a personal example from her own field of economics. In the Baha'i teachings, it says that, that our reality is our thought, and the way we think about the world, the way we perceive it, what we believe about it, how how we think it works, the categories that we employ, all of those things have shaped the structures of our society and they shape our behavior. We, we won't be able to change our behavior to the extent that's needed if we don't also change structures and we won't be able to change those if we're not able to change the way we think and perceive and understand reality. And in, in the Baha'i writings, it also says that knowledge is 
as wings to our lives and a ladder for our ascent. And we can understand that individually, but we also there's also a collective dimension to it that we need to generate the knowledge that's needed for us to advance and to build that world that, that we can imagine and to address the problems that we face. And I think in this conversation, we're going to talk more about uh, the relationship between science and religion. You can think about both of them as systems of knowledge and practice, and then ask about what the relationship between them could, could be and should be. And that's really one of the fundamental questions in the seminar that we're um, going to share about. But if I could just give an illustration, if we, if we think about profession, different professional fields or academic disciplines, they all have a body of knowledge and then in some cases, you know, a set of practices, but a body of knowledge that, that's sort of foundational to these fields. And it rests on certain assumptions and those need to be questioned. When I was a student, in the beginning of my studies, I was taking an introductory economics class. And during one of the lectures, a, a fellow student asked a question. And as the professor was answering, he made the point that the, the field of economics that we were studying, the discipline, does not place the question of whether the goods and services that are produced by an economy are shared appropriately within the society. So the question of poverty is not sort of a central question to the field. And I was very surprised and the other students sitting around me also, I, I noticed that they were also taken aback and the professor himself noticed. Um, because I think like me, many of them had assumed that studying economics was about fixing things, making things better and addressing problems like pro poverty. And the professor sort of chuckled and he made a comment like, yeah, that's a, a funny, an odd thing, isn't it? But then he continued the lecture. And so we sitting there were sort of sh shocked for a moment, but then we had to place that question aside and just continue to follow you know, the lecture of what he was teaching us. We had to sort of accept, accept that assumption in order to be able to continue to learn this uh, you know, particular, this discipline. And I think in the association, we really do hope that we can go back to questions like that, bring them out, talk about them, and also think about if this assumption isn't the most useful, the most helpful one for humanity, what are the other assumptions that we need as the foundation for knowledge within this discipline? Dr. Tusi introduces the recent seminar exploring methodology in the social sciences. So I think it would help to start off talking a little bit about what we mean when we talk about methodology. When we're talking about the methodology of social sciences, uh, what we're trying to understand here is how do we generate knowledge about social reality? Um, uh, how do we understand human nature? How do we seek out information about these things? How do we judge the validity of the data that we've gathered. When we're talking about methodology, when we're discussing this, we're trying to ask questions about the knowledge systems that have given shape to our um, social, our economic, our political systems, uh, our you know, human civilization. And so what is the basis on which we and humanity as a whole comes to explain why we behave the way that we do? And if we're thinking about that, we can think about what are the intellectual foundations for the better world that we want to build. So uh, the Association for Baha'i Studies held a, a series of seminars on methodology uh, going back to 2019 and then adjusting both in person and then adjusting for the pandemic that were often held over the summers. And there were different disciplinary subgroups. So there was one for economics, there was one for education and so on. And our group was a social sciences uh, group. And we started to, you know, we had some reading that we did for the, the sessions, we got together, we discussed it, and then we decided to keep going. So it became this ongoing reading group. We would get together I think every a few weeks or every month. We would read and we would meet and discuss. We would invite people who are thinking deeply about these things kind of as guest speakers to come and share their experiences. And we kept trying to articulate 
through writing and through discussion, some of the underlying intentions that were propelling these questions around methodology. So as our group worked through these materials and these concepts that described the challenges and the advances in methodological thought over the past few decades, we wanted to take an approach that kind of went beyond simply critique or analyzing conflicts. Uh, so instead we tried to identify kind of the trends, the aspirational trends in the development of methodology that seemed promising, right? That highlight the most positive aspects of these approaches, although some of them may kind of still be in process, still be nascent. And we started to try and write those down. That became the focus of an article that we spent, I'm just going to say several months <laughs> writing. And the overall process, I would say, take, it took about three years. And as we were discussing, you know, how do we, how do we then share what we we're writing more generally? And we began to discuss this idea of inviting people to participate, inviting a, a broader conversation around this, inviting a kind of a consultative inquiry approach. So there is a model that's used by several journals in my field of psychology, where one article will be kind of posted publicly or shared, um, and it's considered the kind of the focus article, the focal article. And it might be um, sent out to a few people who are invited to write commentaries. And so those commentaries are then published along with the original article and a, a response written by the original author so that you can kind of see this, this conversation unfolding in a single journal issue. Now, what happens in my field is often that the, the article that's selected is a little bit spicy and the tone can be a little bit combative. But what we were trying to do is take this existing model and see if we can get like look at the highest aspirations of this model. So how do we build on this and create something that is a, a different tone, a more consultative tone, one that benefits from the skills of consultation and the attributes that are required for consultation. Um, and part of the reason that this was important to us is that you know, Baha'u'llah says that consultation is a shining light, which in a dark world leadeth the way and guideth. And that consultation is the, the source of awareness, the cause of awareness. And so with all these benefits <laughs> you know, attributed to consultation, we decided to convene a seminar and create a space, an atmosphere where many different people could come together and explore these aspirational trends that we identified, expand upon them, highlight the new insights that they brought. And then the hope was to collect some of the ideas that emerged from that and put them together as essays for a special issue of the Journal of Baha'i Studies. So we started by posing the questions, how can the social sciences contribute to the construction of more just, peaceful, and ecologically viable social forms? What does it mean for social science methodologies to mature towards this end? And Malik, you were a, a participant in that seminar, so I was wondering if you would want to share a little bit about your experience. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that struck me about what you just said about consultation is that it touches on, I think, a lot of dimensions of <laughs> the, the challenges that we experience in, in the social sciences. There is, it seems to me, historically, a, a way of approaching the investigation of reality that's focused on acquiring the authority to sort of unilaterally define the truth. And that way of approaching the investigation of reality, I think, leads to a lot of the inequities and the structural problems that, that we've been talking about. And it seems to me that the approach that uh, the, the Association for Baha'i Studies is trying to foster and trying to learn more about is more focused on a collective investigation of reality as, a, as opposed to um, an authoritative definition of reality that's enforced with power. Um, uh, th that question in and of itself, I think, is sort of at the heart of a lot of the more spicy discourses, as you put it, <laughs> that, that we see in the social sciences. And, you know, taking that approach, taking, taking the approach that the Association for Baha'i Studies is trying to foster, I found was not just illuminating in, in 
just refreshing. Um, it was healing for me. And so, you know, being able to just embrace those differences of perspective and to, and to explore them and to see what they mean. And at the same time, to embrace the process of striving together and supporting one another. I think that, I think that, that sense of healing is really, I, I think I felt that too, because it can feel overwhelming. <laughs> You know, it can feel overwhelming to try and present a different or a distinct viewpoint and to have those moments where you realize that you don't have to be, you know, the whole ocean. You can just be a drop in the ocean or drop in the wave. You know, you're, 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 there are others who are with you and that the, the unique perspectives that you bring are valued. I think that's what is so precious about when we start to appreciate what we each bring and create the space where everyone is encouraged and everyone's contribution is is valued and kind of seen for how important it is. And I think this this is a, a good time to talk about kind of the, the what were the consultative principles that we apply to um, this process and the process of consultative inquiry as a whole. Um, because, you know, again, going back to this concept from before that consultation has this incredible power, right? Because, you know, no one person can claim to understand all of reality, right? No one person can grasp the complexity and the comprehensiveness of, of the truth. But we still believe that there is a truth, that there is, you know, one actual reality that exists beyond human com comprehension in that case. And Although we as humans are finite beings, you know, unable to grasp that immense truth, the diversity that exists amongst our backgrounds, our perspectives, our understandings, our disciplines, our you know, passions and all these things, this diversity is so precious because it gives us a chance to get insights from a lot of different angles, from a lot of different uh, perspectives. We can understand the phenomena that we're trying to study a little bit more and come a little bit closer to understanding this huge thing called reality systematically. Yeah, it's almost like our minds are different and that's very good and beautiful. And it's also an indication of the fact that they're made for each other. Like they're made to be, like we're puzzle pieces that need to interlock with each other to give the, the whole picture of the puzzle. I think that's a beautiful analogy. Yeah, the the complementarity of our of our diversity. There, there's divergence in our diversity, but there's also convergence. Um, and difference isn't necessarily antithesis. Um, I, I think remembering that is helpful and in, in coming to a deeper appreciation of the value of the variety of perspectives that we bring. It makes you hopeful for the future. All the things that we will be able to understand better by coming together and investigating reality together. One of the questions that came up during the seminar was thinking about who, who you are as a researcher, the, the role of the researcher as a human being living on this planet with all of us, with hopes for it, perhaps, and and then how that translates into your work in research. And there are there are forces and there are structural elements that might make it hard to go in a certain direction that you want to go in. But it was interesting to think about the the more spiritual dimensions of uh, intellectual work. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts that they would like to share about that conversation from the seminar. Um, well, something that comes to mind is some of the conversation that we had about just being conscious that um, our interpretation of reality is never perspective free, right? And that's not something that's a liability or pathology, that's actually a source of richness and a, a way of gaining deeper insight into our common reality. Um, and the aspirations that we talk about, I think, revolve around figuring out a way to identify ways of, of understanding the givens of our reality, right? The facts of our reality. Um, and at the same time, to identify 
some core shared aspirations and to turn all of that somehow into a framework from which we can explore these diverse perspectives on reality so that diversity doesn't become a threat. Um, it actually becomes a way of enriching our understanding of our common reality. You know, this the question of like, what is the nature of the researcher? What is the, the identity of the self that's involved in social scientific research? I think it has so many implications because first it has implications for the questions we ask. You know, what is the purpose and meaning that we uh, understand and bring to the research? But it also has implications for the qualities we try to cultivate in ourselves that we bring to research. Uh, humility, uh, the ability to listen to, you know, views that are unfamiliar, all, you know, all the sort of qualities that in you know, a Baha'i community we're trying to uh, foster through the training institute and through various educational imperatives we're engaged in. And that, of course, many people from many backgrounds around the world are also trying to foster in various ways. And I think at the heart of that, one thing that becomes very relevant in, in the academic sphere is how one manages the ego, right? Because the, the ego, the insistent self, it can be fed in academia. It can be actually stimulated in really unhealthy ways. So it, it you know, the, the question, what is the nature of the researcher? How do I understand myself as a you know, social scientist? And what is my responsibility to quiet the ego? <laughs> Uh, that becomes, you know, one of these very relevant questions, I think, that has methodological implications for how we practice the social sciences and how we investigate reality. Yeah, I was thinking about how it kind of sometimes works the other way, too, that your, your ego can be kind of crushed, <laughs> your, your sense of self-esteem and self-worth can be so belittled. And it, it makes me think of the quote, um, you're even as the bird which soareth with the full force of its mighty wings. And, and this, this vision that we have this capacity, right? We have this, this, this capacity of flight, but you know, in, in this context, I'm also thinking about the, the perspective that you see when you're flying, you know, you, you get a broader perspective of the whole, the whole environment, the whole landscape. And you know, in, in that original quote, the bird is impelled to, you know, it goes down to the dust and its, its wings are covered with clay and it can't fly again. It's powerless to shake off this burden. And there's, there's something about recognizing that you are, recognizing what your true self is, that you are a bird with this capacity, that you have this capacity inside you. I, I think a lot of this conversation for me comes back to this, these kind of two quotes, one, which is the you know, we're all created to carry forward an ever advancing civilization and that that we're minds rich in gems of inestimable value. And and once you think about the capacity that every human being has, it unlocks so much potential in terms of our our efforts to understand social realities. So maybe we could share a little bit more about how religion can contribute to the discourses that we're thinking about as a, an individual, perhaps, who has a religious perspective they can bring to their work, or if we also just step back and think generally, what does religion have to say about social reality and about processes of transformation that we can draw on that can then shape the investigation of social reality through the social sciences. I, I was thinking of uh, going back to the example that I gave in the economics class. Like from a from a religious perspective, very clearly, we need to address poverty and we need to address justice within within an economy and in, within a society. And so, if we take that as like a fundamental requirement of a system of knowledge about economic life, 
and then allow that to play out, it would really change the discipline. So if the if the if we understand very clearly that the purpose of this body of knowledge and of people working together to understand economic systems and economic life is to help us create economic justice, then it leads to a set of different questions to be asking, and it will require different methods and ways of learning about knowledge. You know, this question of the role of religion in the work of the social scientist, one thing that makes me think about is, so the teachings of Ahala offer a perspective on human history that gives us a certain hope, but also orients us in a certain direction. So, right, Bahá'u'lláh suggests we can think about humanity as a whole in a developmental sort of manner that's similar to the, the maturation of the individual, advancing through stages of relative immaturity, sort of moving through our turbulent adolescence right now, but that we're moving on towards a state of maturity. And that, that understanding actually imparts a certain hope. And it also enables us to analyze the social forces that play in the world around us through a certain lens. So for instance, we can try to look at and understand both the forces of social disintegration that are occurring around us as like the, you know, the habits of childhood <laughs> have to be sort of left behind. Uh, but we can also think about the forces of integration and really sort of try to analyze and understand what are those forces that are actually contributing towards our maturity, to helping us advance. It's not uncommon for social scientists to be trained to look primarily at those forces of disintegration <laughs> as sort of all the problems that are mounting problems in the world and lose sight of the integrative forces. But in fact, we have to understand those integrative forces just as much as the, the disintegrative forces. So it raises a whole set of questions, I think, for the social scientist about not just what's, what's wrong with the world and you know, why or what's the source of the many social problems we face, but in fact, where are those examples of constructive progress we can learn from it reminds me a little bit of, you know, in the field of marriage counseling. For for years, the field studied very hard, like, you know, what can we learn from marriages that are failing so that we can impart some knowledge to, you know, couples about hopefully how to avoid those failures. But at some point, you know, psychologists began to look at the question of, well, maybe we need to look at marriages that are succeeding. What can we learn from healthy marriages, from from marriages that are that really are working, so that when we're counseling couples, we actually know what are the, the constructive forces at play within healthy marriages. And I think there's a way in which social science more broadly can be informed by that posture. And, and religion, I think, actually can foster that, a, a desire to identify those integrative, constructive forces that play in the world to figure out how to build on them and expand them. And that raises questions then for methods, like what are the methods you need to do that work? Thinking about, I was, I was just, I was just appending, but I was thinking about the, the research on prejudice and stereotyping and discrimination and how for, you know, for many decades, it's kind of been, you know, originally it was, it wasn't even seen as a problem. It was kind of explained as the the natural outcome of uh, you know either cognitive processes or or uh, social processes. And I think one thing that you know religion gives us is the awareness that it's not inevitable. It's not inevitable to hate or or be prejudiced towards others who are different from you. And so more and more, you see this emphasis on how do we, how do we reduce or eliminate prejudice? How do we inoculate people against prejudice? How do we create uh, environments or communities where that never has a chance to take root? And I think we're, we're starting to see more and more of that. 
Yeah, these are really profound and powerful questions. And to come back to the question that Michael was raising about um, human nature, I think it might be fair to say that just as science is a way of investigating uh, the nature of external reality, religion is an approach to investigating at its core ways of attaining a deeper understanding of our intrinsic capacities of, as, as human beings, um, our creative and our evaluative and um, our uh, social capacities as well. In investigating that process, I guess there's a way of understanding human nature as a set of appetites, a set of impulses that need to be gratified and life itself as a means of gratifying those appetites and impulses. And maybe that's alluding to what Michael was talking about in terms of ego. And we very often, I think, <laughs> as your own example is, illustrates, Sylvie, and I think very often we bring that perspective with us into um, the social sciences. But there's another way of understanding human nature in terms of um, the aspirations that we're talking about, aspirations toward justice, aspirations toward unity, um, aspirations toward service. And I think it's worth raising questions about that way of naturalizing that perspective of of, of human reality. We all come to the work that we do with a perspective on who we are, why we are, and how we ought to be in the world, whoever we are. And, you know, adopting the posture of false agnosticism that we see that we see so often, where we pretend that we don't have that, <laughs> that might be, you know, the, the root of many of these things that we're talking about in terms of like the conflicts and the obstacles that we, that, we're, that we have to address. I think related to the points that you're all making, there is also a sense of the need for, uh, within the social sciences, more worldviews, more different worldviews, more different voices and perspectives. And one of the things that we touched on in the seminar was how the current, the current set um, practices within the social sciences of methodologies and so on, but also the current bodies of knowledge that exist have evolved in traditions that were rooted in the West, in Europe and, and North America and so on. And increasingly, of course, people are participating all over the world, which is important, but then also to not participate within something that's sort of limited by its origins, but to be able to draw on other worldviews in terms of culture and to shape thinking and practice within the social sciences. But then in a sense, religion also offers another uh, resource, conceptual resource and, and spiritual resource for shaping um, what this, how the social sciences work and, and the way they think about their own knowledge and the way they help us benefit from diversity. You've been listening to In Conversation, a podcast series from the Baha'i World News Service. For more podcasts and stories, visit news.baha'i.org.